I was scolded last week because I started talking on my way down the steps and Bob didn't get a chance to get the camera going. <laughs> yeah, I was told, do not start your sermon until you're down in the mountain. <coughs> and now it doesn't want to change direction. Okay, fine. <laughs> There it goes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not one of those preachers who memorizes a sermon or can just have talking points and speak off the top of the head. And one of the reasons I don't, if you go to my blog where I print every sermon, I have quotes and references throughout my sermon. I do want, do not ever want to misquote somebody. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. First line of today's reading is, well, here we are again, folks, just as we promised last week. When we last saw our hero, he had just made this statement. Uh, the people in the crowd had sort of explained their anticipation that they expected more literal bread or manna from heaven, just as Moses had given the Israelites. However, Jesus explained it was not Moses, but God that gave the bread from heaven. And then he makes the statement, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Quote, in last Sunday's text, the center of attention was upon Jesus as the gift from the Father for the life of the world. <coughs> Building on that claim, this Sunday's text focuses on Jesus as the center of faith to which the Father draws people. The movements within chapter 6 for these two Sundays are certainly interconnected. But they're not identical. Jesus is not simply repeating himself, and John is not writing in circles, though some may think so, especially with John's mystical language. It sometimes seems this way. John is writing something specific here, and he is very intentional in verse 35. We hear the first of the I am statements of Jesus. Does anyone know where we first hear the I am statement? What is the first I am you hear in the Gospels? Or in the, better yet, in the Old Testament? Oh, I am. Moses in front of the burning bush. If I come, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say, the God of your fathers has sent me, to you, and they asked me, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am the bread of life, is the first of seven I am statements in John's Gospel. These statements are unique to John, and in many ways encapsulate the distinctiveness of John's presentation of Jesus. The I am beginnings of these sayings is more than, more if it is stronger in the Greek than expressed in the awkward English, which is true for many of our translations. But I am often reminds readers of the revealed name of God from the burning bush story in Exodus. And to be sure, from the opening verse, the divine nature is front and center in John. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. The striking feature common to all of the I Am sayings in John, however, is that they all express Jesus' relationship to humanity. The other six are, I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. One commentator asked this intriguing question. What does Jesus mean by proclaiming himself the bread of life? At one level, the answer can be put simply. Jesus means that he is the source of eternal life for the world, and explanation expressed straightforwardly in verse 47 through 48. If the meaning were that simple, though, there would be little reason for Jesus to have used symbolism in the first place. 
Nothing is simple in the Gospel of John. Jesus' I am statement is not just about who he is metaphorically, but it can be literally seen to telling us from where he does come, from where he originates. This is where things start to get interesting. If you know last week, Jesus was addressing the 5,000 who he had just fed, but in today's text, Jesus' dialogue companion suddenly shifts to, quote, the Jews. Now, the Jews are not all the Jewish people in, in some context. It refers to the Jewish people who are opposed to the followers of Christ. In another context, it refers to Jewish people who are afraid of other Jewish people. And in still another context, it refers to Jesus himself. John uses the term the Jews in many different levels. It's not referring to one nation. Quote, one prominent feature of the fourth gospel is that it is repeated mention of the Jews, the Greek word ladoi, generally translated as Jews in our English Bibles. It appears 67 times in the Gospel of John. In many cases, the people so designated are the opponents of Jesus, and eventually the Jews actively seek his death. In some of these verses, make positive statements about Jews. In John, Jesus himself, a Jew, as you read in John 4, 9, states that salvation is of the Jews. So moreover, a number of the passages cannot possibly refer to an entire Jewish community because it says there are Jewish people who fear Jewish people. Basically, it's kind of like the same thing of our community around us today. We're afraid of some sections of our community. We, we honor other sections of our community, yet we're all humanity. <coughs> in John's Gospel, the word Jews has multiple implications. And in this case, it's very clever. Remember, the Jews were referring to the manna from heaven feeding the people, taking us back to a time of Moses in the desert. And just like back then, the Jews started complaining. Really, you can put in the word people. The people started complaining. So Jesus had made an I am statement. And both this phrase and the phrase bread from heaven were referenced to the story of man. Jesus' initial statement in verse 35 associates him with the life giving power of the manna in the desert, in the wilderness. The illness, the Israelites had neither food nor drink and would have died without God's provision. So also, Jesus has just provided miraculous food for 5,000 people. And also like the man story, Jesus is not only talking about the relief of literal hunger, the man story is a story about trust in God. Trust in God. God saved Israel from slavery in Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea. But once in the desert, Israel did not trust God to provide for them. Even so, God provided both food and water throughout the 40 years. And just as the Israelites complained to Moses, also, quote, the Jews complain about Jesus. And the word complain, the Greek word is ganguzo, is a cognate of the words used in the Old Testament. So, in other words, it's familial, same word as way back then when they complained, right now they complain. It could be translated more like grumbling against God and Moses, or grumbling against Jesus. The grumbling of the crowd characterizes them as the same as the Israelites in the Exodus story. They have experienced God's salvation, yet they do not fully trust in God. <coughs> Jesus takes us a bit further by introducing the statement of being drawn. No one can come to me unless they are drawn by the Father. Here we have God at work again. God draws people to Christ. One commenter even suggests something a bit more dramatic. He says, the first time it is stated negatively, no one is able to come to me unless drawn by the Father. The verb translated as drawn could be translated more intensive word as drag. In other words, no one comes to Jesus without the Father's pull, without being dragged along, without kicking and screaming. We've all been there at one time or another fighting against where God is drawing us to. So how are we drawn to Christ? What is this mystical pull that the Creator offers to us? 
I went to the forest, and I think we can find it here. It's the ancient texts. Jesus is saying that all we have learned of the human experience and all our relation to the Creator keeps leading us on. Jesus even takes it a step further in saying in the next verse, Jesus refers to Scripture and states it all positively instead. All who heard from the Father and learned from what they heard from Him will come to me. Here, the teaching from God and the learning from that teaching will result in coming to Jesus. Now, different churches have different contexts and different understanding of what it means to come to Jesus. <laughs> but John's own context and community has different layers of this meaning. See, it's important, it may be important to invoke um, some of the options. So, for the Jews, in Jesus' context, it would be to choose a messianic understanding of their own tradition. For the Jews in the context of John's Gospel, in other words, the people he is writing for, it would mean choosing a step outside of the Jewish tradition and moving into the Christian context. And in today's context, here, it might mean moving outside the typical pattern of our own culture and choosing a radical Christian understanding of the world. In today's context, we need to step outside our cultural context and choose a radical understanding of God operating in the world today and how we are called, how we are drawn, how we are pulled, and sometimes even dragged into that. In this text, Jesus is calling to those who have one concept of how the world works, who have one concept of how God operates within their world, we are being called to evaluate and re-evaluate and evaluate even once more, over and over, what our role is as Christians in this world. How we perceive and conceive and understand God to be operating here and now in this world. All this does not happen in a vacuum. It is dependent on learning and seeking God's words. It is dependent upon us seeking that connection to God, and it's through that connection to God that we are drawn to Jesus. <coughs> it's about being open to new possibilities and new realities in and through Christ. This sometimes means letting go of what we know well, perhaps this is what happened to the crowd with Jesus. They knew too much for Jesus' words to ring true. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And the Judeans object. They murmur among themselves. They complain. These are the insiders, the one who know the history. They know how God does things and how things should be done when dealing with God. This is the way we have done it. This is the way it has always been. So this is the way we'll be doing it. God sent us Moses. Moses led us. Moses fed us. Moses taught us. And we know Moses. And you, sir, are no Moses. The Judeans knew a lot. They know how God operates. And they also know Jesus' origins. Who does he think he is? They mutter, claiming to have come down from heaven, we know his folks. We know he came from Nazareth, not heaven. These Judeans also know their scripture. The bread from heaven was the manna fed to our ancestors back in the time of Moses. They correctly point that out, and these Judeans know the law. The Lord God said, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods. They know it all. It is fun to know that we've heard this grumbling against Jesus before in Matthew. Isn't this a carpenter's son? Isn't this mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? In Luke 4, is this not Joseph's son? In Mark, is this not just the carpenter, the son of Mary? One commenter reflects, maybe they know too much. But perhaps they really don't know enough. 
He says, he tells a story when he was in seminary. I took a trip with the president of the Lutheran College. He was driving and I was reading the student newspaper to him out loud. A pre-seminary student had written an editorial espousing the use of donuts and coffee or pretzels and beer as the elements in the Eucharist. <laughs> when I started to audibly protest, the president raised his hand and smiled and quietly said, remember, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing and it can lead us to the wrong conclusions. The student only knew a little, but in retrospect he said, so did I. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing and it can lead us to the wrong conclusions. When it comes to God and even to the church, we know only a little. Like all living things, the church in our understanding of God continues to grow and to change and so to know only a little and to think that that little that we know is all that there is to know can be fatal. These Judeans had some head knowledge about God and perhaps they did not know God by heart or by trust. They had God all figured out. The rules and the regulations of how things have always been. Funny, maybe they did know God by heart, as in by rote. They knew what to expect of God, and Jesus wasn't it. They had God in a God box. A nice, neat little package. They could not, or would not, allow themselves to imagine something bigger, to imagine something greater, to imagine something beyond their knowledge or perception. They were unable to hear and know what God was trying to show them. They had made up their minds and did not want to be confronted with what Jesus tried to teach them. Now, sometimes that can ring true for us. When are we like those Judeans way back then? What issues reveal that we know too much about Jesus of our own traditions, but not enough about the living, breathing, growing Word of God as it speaks to us now. When do we allow our knowledge of the history of the past to close our eyes to the working of God in the present? When are we looking and listening with open hearts? When are we willing to be drawn to the bread of life, rather than to put our trust in what we know? If you think about it, we once knew slavery was okay and justified by the Bible. We once knew that women should not speak from the pulpit. We once knew that women actually were property. We once knew that the races should be separated. We once knew that children should work in factories or dig coal. Heck, we once knew that coal and cigarettes were good for us. You know? History shows us that we've been called past what we know. We're always again and again. God calls us to something more, something bigger, something wiser, something more loving, something that can only make us better. God has called us to be an ONA church, and that goes beyond simply letting gay people through our front door. It's calling us to think about how we have to yet heal our race relations. God is calling us to rethink on just what our borders are and what it means to love and care for those who are seeking us out as a refuge in a safe place. God is always calling and drawing us out, pulling us further, sometimes kicking and screaming all the way. What do we do when leaving everything up to God seems naive? if not ridiculous. What we do, what do we do with what we know God is calling us to, and yet our culture or our context maybe says no? What do we do when we had enough of a silly church talk because we just know too much for it to be true? What do we do when the greatest gift we have to share is compassion, and love, and yet it's too scary for us to do. Jesus is not calling us to abandon our knowledge and tradition as if they still cannot teach and help and guide us. 
Jesus cautions us that our knowledge will not give us an absolute answer or a foolproof plan to make things right. God's answer is rarely to reassure us that our knowledge and understanding are correct. If anything, God uses our knowledge and our, to give us a purpose, to set us on a journey, to give us a new direction, namely, to trust and follow Jesus. Whatever the details of this journey are for us, its purpose is to draw us into life as part of God's coming reign, which is human constructed circumstances and conditions cannot undermine or negate. The risk of setting out on this journey, which is trusting and following Jesus, is that even when we think we have a map or a plan, there's going to be a fork in the road. We do not really know where we are going or where we will end up. Sometimes we're stuck there and we just have to take a prayer, take a deep breath, and take a step. The good news is that Jesus, rather than our knowledge and understanding, is the source of our calling and the source of our strength. What makes it good news is that in those moments when we understand we have enough of this life that we cannot trust Jesus, Jesus has not had enough of us. So rather than turning to our knowledge, perhaps we can turn to Jesus, recognizing that we certainly cannot have enough of Christ. When we put that way, it's a wonder that we aren't so drawn to the bread of life that we double back in line in communion in order to get seconds. When we are in that life, when we just said one prayer, we're called to say one more. When we walk in this path, when we're called to do one act of kindness, we find ourselves doing two. We're always, as long as we put our trust, in God, as long as we put our trust in the Creator, we will be drawn into more of this abundant life that God and Christ calls us into. Amen.